Today, we are, I'm going to touch, I'm going to sort of recap logic because there's a reason why logic and epistemology and other things, and I'm going to be giving you definitions. I told you I was going to be giving you a glossary sheet today. I'm going to be dealing with a lot of definitions. That's a lot of what I'm going to be talking about as we go through. And, but I decided not to give you the glossary sheet today. I will give it to you next week. Um, because I, but you know, you might want to, if you've got paper, you might want to make some notes as you go along, but I will be giving you a lot of what we talk about today and more in a printed form, but for today, I wanted us to walk through some of this stuff because the, it's always hardest when you start. Because a lot of this is learning a whole new language. This is one of the reasons why it's problematic that in, in our, in the U.S. and Canada, we don't teach philosophy at a high school level anymore. It used to be that logic, for instance, was the first course anybody took. Logic and rhetoric were two of the basic courses that you started when your education began. Well, we don't have the vocabulary for those things anymore because we've not been taught them early on. And so part of this is learning a new vocabulary. And one, one of the things, too, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, uh, there is a very strong link between um, epistemology, which is the philosophy of how we know things, and um, semiotics and linguistics. Semiotics is the, is the study of symbols. Um, everything that we do, we do in terms of symbols. We think in words, all right? Um, you may not be aware of that, but we do not think in raw images. You're shaking your head. It's simply true. We think in words. Um, somebody who does not think in words is autistic. Um, Autistic. 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 Um, are you all familiar with um, with um, Temple Grandin? Temple Grandin. Mm -hmm. Temple Grandin is a woman. She has autism. Uh, there's a movie made about her called Temple, and she is responsible for creating um, a completely radical approach to to stockyards, to how we process animals. In fact, they say 80% of all the animals who go through stockyards slaughter in the United States now go through systems she invented. Well, the reason that she invented this is she does not think in words. She thinks purely in images, and in that way, she is able to understand things from the perspective that a, an animal does, a cow does. She does not think the way people think. People think in words. You may not believe that, but it's true. In fact, when we get into... Um, the, the idea of perception, which we'll talk about a little bit today, we'll discuss that. But the idea of thinking in symbols or words, linguistics, the study of language, semiotics, that's not symbiotics, there's no B in there, symbiotics is the relationship between uh, uh, groups. Semiotics, S-E-M-I-O-T-I-C, is the study of symbols and how symbols are created and how we derive meaning or either in, um, interject meaning into them. So we'll talk about that. Terry? Okay, um, this is a good example of truth. Uh, there is a um, movie called Quest for Fire. Mm -hmm. I know it. There's no words in it, just grunts and groans. There's exactly. no language uh. in, as we understand it. But yet you can understand Oh, it's a fascinating movie. movie. Don't believe something's boring just if you haven't seen it yet. Okay. okay. But, but what I'm, where I'm coming from is people read, you use the word thinking and it captures a lot of things. People reason in words. And they reflect in words. Right. But they process images all the time. Kind of all the people live out of their images. Marketers know you want to persuade people, you show them images and they, they appeal to them. So thinking reasoning is in words and much right. of our thinking is in words, but it's not limited to only words. That, well, that's my and, and one of the things we're going to talk about today, when I say we think of words, when I'm thinking conceptually, I conceptualize in words. That's different than say processing images, as how I take things in. But then, as I work with those things, I work with them in terms of verbal symbols that I have attached to those things. We're going to talk about perception today, and how perception and reality are not the same thing, ever. Okay, just okay. another comeback. Right, and I, we need to go on, but go ahead. The, uh, that's all right. The feeling of love, whether it's Christian love or, or uh, relationship with a partner love, mm -hmm. those kind of thing, often is an expression of feeling that is comes before the expression of words. So, I don't know whether you call that thinking or not, but uh, there's emotions involved that are not always expressible in words. We have experiences that are not reflected in words, but any processing we do are processing of symbols. Now, our, our usual way of processing uh, symbols is the symbols of words. That doesn't mean that's the only experiences we have. Okay, we're getting way ahead of ourselves. Sorry. All right, so let's back up. 
let's go through this stuff. We will get to the issue of perception. Now, when I, the reason I mention up front that this is, a logist, uh, this is a linguistic and symbiotic or simple problem is when we say truth, what does that mean? See, that's the question. Truth is a symbol. That word is a symbol. What you think that symbol means in terms of any reality, and what somebody else thinks that symbol means, the word true, T-R-U-T-E, or you know, veritas, if you want to use Latin or whatever word you use, that symbol, what is behind that symbol, is different for different people. That's why this whole philosophy and the issue of especially epistemology, this particular branch of philosophy, is closely linked to linguistics and semiotics, the study of symbols. Because part of this is an issue of definition, which is an issue of how we translate symbols. Fair? And so we'll get into that a little bit today. But when, whenever you start looking at major philosophers, especially postmodern philosophers, and we'll talk a little bit about this in future weeks, like Jacques Derrida, who turned the, you know, the philosophical world upside down 30 years ago or so. I'm fascinated by the fact that I seldom see his name mentioned anymore which is good. <laughs> Derrida was a, and, and Saucere and other modern philosophers or philosophers who have influenced modern thinking were predominantly linguists or semioticists, meaning they deal in symbols and language because that has become the capital, that has become the, the, uh, the, the means by which we interact on philosophical terms. So understand when we, my point of saying that up front, when we talk about things like truth, Understand that part of this is a linguistic question. What do we mean by that word? And a word is a symbol. So that's why we get into symbols. That's part of the challenge. And how do we get past all of that confusion to something that matters? All right? So this week, I'm going to briefly go over some of the issues of formal logic. There's a lot, there's a lot in the book, and it's really valuable. When you start looking, about, uh, looking at those formal uh, <coughs> fallacies, which are fallacies in structure, fallacies in the way that an argument is constructed, the informal fallacies, which are basically just uh, errors, assumptions that are made wrongly, um, you will find, and the book does a good job of giving you his examples, examples from everyday life of how those fallacies are used in silly ways. You, if you study those and have at least a, a reasonable understanding of all of those kinds of fallacies, you will be able to poke holes in a lot of the very stupid things that people get away with saying these days. Okay? Doesn't help them change their mind. No, <laughs> but it will help you know that that's not true. Okay, your job, before you start worrying about changing somebody else, is you need to make sure you're not screwing up. That's right. And this will help you think better so that you don't fall victim to those wrong arguments. And so I'm not going to go into a lot of that detail today, but that section of the book is very valuable in terms of helping you think better. Because it will help you recognize how people go wrong and try to convince you to go wrong in how they think about things. Fair? I mean, you read those sections already, so you know what I'm saying. Today we're going to primarily talk about truth and epistemology. Epistemology I will define for you again, but it is the study of how we know and how we justify what we think we know or our beliefs. And all of those words have very particular meaning in philosophy. Right? Knowledge, truth, justification, very important words. Linguistics and semiotic symbolism come into this because it's an issue of understanding clearly what it is we're talking about. Okay? Next week, metaphysics. There's a reason we start with epistemology. It's the same reason why when we were studying systematic theology, I started not with the doctrine of God, but the doctrine of the Bible. Because first we have to know, how do we know? Then we can talk about what we know. So we start with epistemology, how do we know? And then we start talking about other branches of philosophy, like metaphysics, which is the nature of reality, and you know, what is real, after we figured out how it is we learn things and know things, right? September 5th, no class, and then we go on from there. Okay, let's jump into this. Uh, the first few slides here, I'm going to be uh, just going over what we had last week, again, as a, as a ramp up. Philosophy literally is the love of wisdom from the phileo, Greek for love, and sophos, the Greek for wisdom. Um, three definitions, all of which are valuable to you, I think. Philosophy is the critical examination. Critical does not mean negative. It simply means to think hard about something. 
We have certain perceptions, like I had somebody argue with using the word argue, or disagree with using the word argument. Argument is a technical expression in, in philosophy. It's not a negative. To say critical examination, that's not a negative. That doesn't mean we're looking for something wrong. It just means we're looking at it honestly. So philosophy is a critical examination of our foundational beliefs concerning the nature of reality, of knowledge, and truth, and our moral and social values. What comes out of that's why this is important, it's because our moral and social values come out of our perception of the nature of reality, knowledge, and truth, ultimately. And you may not even know it, but it's true for you too. Or you can say philosophy is the means and process by which we examine our lives and the meaning in our lives. Or philosophy is the attempt to think rationally and critically, again not a negative, critically about life's most important questions in order to obtain knowledge and wisdom about them. This class is primarily an introduction to philosophy. I call it philosophical theology because always the overriding uh, objective we have in obtaining knowledge and wisdom is from a godly point of view, from a Christian point of view, always with the sense that scripture informs all of this to us, right? Why is it important? Ideas matter. The ideas that one believes largely determine the kind of person we become. Our understanding of knowledge, reality, and truth will dictate our moral values and actions. That's always the case. People always used to know that was true. We taught values for that very reason. We don't do it anymore. People have forgotten that what you think affects how you act. We all have a worldview. I define worldview as what we believe about the world and our place in it. That's my definition. Philosophy rightly done can give us a better worldview. Christian philosophy rightly done will give you a better Christian worldview. Philosophy examines our assumptions, it asks questions, it seeks to clarify and analyze concepts, it seeks to organize facts into a rational system for all disciplines. Every discipline. Philosophy is the umbrella over everything else in terms of helping us clearly think about that. As I said last week, that's why a doctor of philosophy is the highest level degree you can get in almost any discipline. Doctor of philosophy in music, a doctor of philosophy, you know, there are other things like doctor of education or doctor of musicology or whatever. But a PhD, a doctor of philosophy, it's because you have a philosophy of science, a philosophy of education, a philosophy of music, a philosophy of, of uh, gardening. There is a philosophy of everything, which means to step back and think critically and hard about what the basic elements of this are and what we think about. That's why philosophy is important. Philosophy also gives us a clearer understanding of life and what is important by teaching us to examine our core beliefs and ideas. Related to that, Socrates, one of the first, the first great, that is, at least that we're aware of, there were others before Socrates actually, but he's the one we know of, that most of us know of. Socrates said an unexamined life is not worth living. What that means is that if we don't think critically, philosophically, if you will, about our human life, what it means to be human, what is important, how we live, all of those kinds of issues, then we might as well just be an animal. We're nothing more than a mammal if we don't use the one part of us that God gave us that is distinctly different, which is our mind, related to that is our spirit, I don't deny that because philosophy affects our spiritual situation as well. So it makes us more human. It helps us as we examine our core beliefs and ideas to become more what God wants us to be. God does not want his servants to be unthinking. He wants us to love him with our mind as well as the rest of us, as Jesus said. Right? Any questions about that kind of sort of reintroduction to the whole philosophy and why we're doing it? I'm not going to do this every week, but I thought it was valuable as we came in today to do that again. Now, we also talked last week about formal logic. And I'm going to do just a couple of slides here to remind you. The most basic principles, and there are three of them, that are called the laws of logic. Sometimes they're called the laws of thought because they are so fundamental to thinking rationally or reasonably. These laws of thought, or the first principles of logic, Without them, nothing else makes sense. They are the basic way in which we, and we need to understand these because by themselves, they will shoot down a lot of irrational thinking. These three laws are first, the law of identity. And all of these are often expressed in mathematical formulas. You've noticed that as you've gone through the book. 
The law of identity is P equals P, which means a thing is what it is. Or, by extension, all true propositions are true, all false propositions are false. Now, without that, as a basic principle, something is what it is, can be bar the door. Any kind of stupidity can be admitted. You know? Um, well, you say that sky is blue, but uh, I say it's green. Well, it is what it is. Now, maybe your eyes work differently than mine, and we're seeing the same thing, and you, or, or we're seeing the same thing, and you call it something else. But make no mistake that at its core, something is what it is, and don't. We can't fiddle with that. Secondly, the law of non-contradiction, which this expression means something cannot be both P and not P. Something can't both be and not be at the same time and in the same way or same sense or same respect. Another way to say that is something can't be both true and false at the same time and in the same respect. And the third, the law of the excluded middle. Something cannot be both P and not P. Um, or something must be, I'm sorry, not, that, I just gave you the law of non contradiction again. Something, something is either P or not P. It's either true or false. There's no third option, is what the law of the excluded middle means. Now, you could say something is partly true, if it's something complex. But an absolute something is either true or not true. It either is or it is not. The example that I gave you, which I will use twice a week till I die, because it's such a beautiful example of this, is when on the Dick Cavett show, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and in her early, more radical years, Jane Fonda was on the show, and Jane Fonda said to the Archbishop, well, Jesus may be the Son of God to you, Archbishop, but he's not to me. And the Archbishop, with his sound knowledge of the basic laws of thought, said, well, either he is or he isn't. Both cannot be true. It cannot be, according to the law of non-contradiction, that he is both the Son of God and not the Son of God. That's a fundamental violation of reason and formal logic. Now, when you understand these things, this will give you the tools. Because logic is a toolbox. That's what it is, formal logic. And when we say logic, we don't mean just common sense. Because what some people think is common sense is anything but common, and it doesn't make sense. <laughs> people can't be trusted in that. But formal logic, the very reason why it's often put in mathematical formulas, it is absolute. And they have constructed every possible valid and invalid variation on, uh, on the premises of formal logic. They're all there. You, the more you know about this, the better you will think and the more ready you are to, to figure out whether an argument being made or a presentation of what somebody claims is true is being made, whether that's true or not, whether that's valid or not, whether that can be accepted or not. Fair? And one more sort of recollection or, or review of what we did last week, and that is the principles of formal logic. Logic employs established rules for correct reasoning. Logic is about reasons. It's about making an argument. Argument is not a negative word. It simply means to lay out a case. An argument's a group of reasons which together achieve a conclusion. It is made up of propositions. Some of them are premises, which are sort of establishing the circumstance, the terms of the argument, and then the final proposition is called a conclusion. The inference is the connection between the premises that lay out the argument and the conclusion, which is what you draw from the premises. This three line, a three line argument in logic is called a syllogism. This is an example. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. You have two premises. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. You have a conclusion which is, therefore, Socrates is mortal. The inference is the way that you can see the conclusion is drawn from the establishment of the first two premises. If you have a logical argument that there is no obvious connection, or clearly not a connection, between the premises and the, and the conclusion, it is called a non sequitur, which is one kind of false argument, one fallacy. Um, non sequitur means it does not follow. When somebody says something, you're in a conversation, and somebody says something that's just, and you go, where did that come from? That's called a non sequitur. That doesn't follow from the rest of the conversation. 
Well, this is an example of a non sequitur argument. All of these statements, the premises um, and the conclusion in this case, are true in terms of being valid. There's nothing uh, formally wrong with them, but th there's no inference that makes sense. John Adams was the second president of the United States is the first premise. That's true. The square root of 81 is 9. That's true. Both of those are valid premises inherent to themselves. But then the conclusion, therefore, I love pizza. All three of those, the two premises and the conclusion, are all valid and true, but there is no legitimate inference. You cannot draw the conclusion from the establishment of the premises. Make sense? I give you this again as just a sort of a, re a review so that you, hopefully, I, I really sincerely hope that you guys have the book and you'll keep it, and that from time to time you'll think about what those, the fallacies of those arguments are. Because logic is a toolbox that will help you think more clearly and help you to make good judgments about the things you hear people saying in the world today. Because there's a whole lot of illogical nonsense out there that's being sold as, as legitimate. Fair? And as Christians, we have an obligation to think well. You can do anything poorly or you can do it well. Too many people think poorly. As Christians, I think we have an obligation to do everything well as honoring to God, including thinking. All right? Any questions about any of that so far? All right. Now we have a little question to consider. What is truth? <laughs> Remember that much of this has to do with meaning. What do we mean by that word? When we ask what is truth, we're basically saying, what does it mean? That's why this is linked to. I'm not going to get a lot into semiotics and, and uh, linguistics. My undergraduate degree is in communication. And much of that communication is communication theory, which is why epistemology is sort of what I oriented toward, because those things are so closely linked. Communication theory has to do with symbols and linguistics to a great extent. And that led me right into epistemology as a major focus, philosophical theology and, and, uh, and philosophy, particularly epistemology. So the question we ask, is, is any, that the West asks, the Western culture, is anything really true? Now obviously, that has to do with definitions of things. But that question, is anything true, is the central philosophical question of the, of the postmodern age. Because you have people saying things all the time, like, well, that may be true for you, but it's not true for me. Well, it doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you, as you believe it with your whole heart. I have heard that said. Now, those are two ways of saying, is anything true in the sense of it being an absolute truth? Is there any such thing as an objective truth? Or is everything simply what you really believe, what you really prefer, what you really decide for yourself? Now, hopefully you can see on the surface of it why that makes a huge difference in terms of the rest of what somebody believes and how they live out their lives. If somebody thinks that all truths are, are uh, relative, that there's no such thing as an absolute truth, then why in the world would they accept Jesus? If the Mormons are offered a better buffet, <laughs> or if, you know, if the Satanists have a great dance band on Saturday night, or whatever else. If it doesn't matter, if, you don't, if there's no such thing as something being true versus untrue, for instance, if there's no objective nature to those things, then on what criteria do we make those kind of decisions? So it is a huge question, and a question that most of the Western world is getting wrong now. <clears throat> so let's talk about that. Modern culture promotes, and when I say modern culture, I mean predominantly. I don't mean everybody. Obviously, you know, a lot of us don't believe this. Modern culture promotes, for the most part, the idea that truth is relative, meaning it is non-absolute. This relativism is the word we use for it, meaning, you know, what's true for you is not true for me, it may not be true for Bill or for Mary. Everybody's got their own truth. That's relativism. The truth is based upon where you're coming from. Relativism takes two popular forms. The first one, and the more common one, is called simply subjectivism. Subjectivism means the subject, the person thinking this, decides. You know, there's subject and then there's object. Subject is me. Object is something outside me. Subjectivism says that truth is whatever a person decides it is, and that all people can therefore be right even when they contradict each other. 
When Jay Fonda said to the Archbishop of Canterbury, Jesus may be the Son of God to you, Archbishop, but he's not to me, she was reflecting a pure, relativistic subjectivism. Understand that? Another approach, which you sometimes hear, particularly in academic settings, is what's called conventionalism. It also is a relativism, uh, kind of relativism. Conventionalism says truth is merely a social construct that is defined by cultures rather than by individuals. Truth is a social construct. You may have heard somebody say sometime, particularly if you were suggesting it's not a good idea to sleep just with somebody you're not married with. This is what you hear in college, for instance. They'll say, well, the only reason you believe that is because your parents or your teachers or your church or your culture taught you that. And you need to cast off the shackles of that conventionalism. All right? Have you heard that sort of thing? That you're only following because somebody told you that. That is a relativistic kind of perspective. So, relativism, there's no such thing as an absolute truth, comes as subjectivism or as conventionalism. Either a person decides or a culture decides without any absolute standard that they're either is called to. Make sense? And again, I think if you think about it, you can remember situations in your life where you've heard that sort of thing. Now, as opposed to relativism, we have objectivism. Objectivism is the belief that truth is not merely a matter of subjective or cultural preference, but rather that truth is a real feature in the world and that it is independent of what someone may think about it. Whether they like it or not, whether they accept it or not, truth is a real thing that exists apart from us. Now, this is the Christian belief. Just a, just a really good example of that, mm -hmm. with symbols. You can't argue that 1 plus 1 equals 2. It is true. There's no debating, no questioning. Right. It's an objective example of what you're talking about. Unless you happen to be a Heisenberg physicist. Uh, never mind. We won't get into the Heisenberg principle of uncertainty. It's there. Um, what's that? But no, it's true. And this is the reason why mathematics... All mathematics. This is the reason why mathematics is often used to reflect logic and other philosophical truths. That's why when you read through this book, when they were presenting you know, the different viewpoints, they would present them in terms of, given hypothesis you know, H, if person P is to accept that, then da-da, and they'll use sort of mathematical symbols. They can put that in an entirely a mathematical equation. The reason they do that is because mathematics is seen as uh, a non-relative truth system, meaning it is absolute. Now again, when you get into more radical modern physics, then there are questions about some of that. But, but from any Newtonian kind of perspective, you know, 1 plus 1 does equal 2. And suggesting otherwise is considered irrational. All right? So, to believe that Christianity takes objectivism as its foundation. This is the way we perceive truth. Um, that something, if it is true, that is absolutely true, I, and again, I, somebody could say something, you say, well, that's partly true. Sometimes that's true, sometimes it's not. I'm talking about absolute truths. Something is or isn't. To believe, objectivism believes that if something is true, that it is true for everyone at all times, even if no one ever believes it. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, whether everybody in the whole world decides they don't believe that anymore or not. It's still true. Even if somebody doesn't like the fact that 1 plus 1 equals 2, they can argue about it all they want to. Whether they believe it or not, or like it or not, it is still true. That's objectivism. It's not a matter of what I think or what I prefer. It's not a matter of what the culture decides it wants to believe. It is objectively true. Now, it's very important for us to understand that since philosophy is usually understood as an effort to discover what is true, and what is good, and what is right, starting with what is true, if the relativists are correct, then philosophy is probably irrelevant. We all ought to go home and take a nap. Because if the truth is that there is no absolute truth, then philosophy doesn't make any sense as a pursuit anymore. Understand that? It is especially important for us as Christians that we have an understanding that we believe in objective truth, not relativistic, 
subjective or contextualized truth or conventionalized truth. We believe in objective truth because Christianity purports to be the absolute truth. Our faith system is one in which we believe this is the objective truth and is not subject to somebody deciding it's not true because they don't like it or they don't understand it or that you know they, they don't want to follow the rules that come along with it. Christianity is a truth-oriented system of beliefs. And we believe that Christianity corresponds to reality. Well, again, whether anybody believes it or not. So this issue of how we perceive truth, relative, objective, or not, is fundamental to everything else. Our, our religious beliefs, our cultural understanding, our actions. Is that fair? Any questions about that? So, how do you respond to the relativists? How do you respond to the people who say, it may be true for you, but it's not true for me? Again, the, I'm, I'm giving you, this is in the book. All right, maybe I should go through and tell you what pages, but you can, you can follow along here. The slides are all available to you. When we say what is truth, we need to understand that saying, as the relativists, the people who don't believe in objective truth say, that there is no absolute truth, that is in itself a self-defeating statement. And you will hear, and you've read in here, they'll talk about defeaters. A defeater is something that defeats an argument, that proves that an argument isn't valid or isn't true. Well, the, uh, the statement by relativists that there is no absolute truth has built into it a defeater. It is self-defeating. Because it purports to be a statement of absolute truth. And yet if it's true, then there are absolute truths, and so it must be false. You, you follow that logical argument? Yes. It's like Captain Kirk when he says, I'm, I always lie. Remember that episode? <laughs> well, yeah, there is. Well, in fact, that's called the Cretan uh, paradox. Ah. You know, that a Cretan philosopher actually wrote that all Cretans are liars. <laughs> Well, this is a philosophical challenge because and it's exactly the same paradox. It's self-defeating because if a Cretan wrote that all Cretans are liars, if that's true, he was lying, which means that Cretans aren't all liars. You see what I mean? Built into this statement of absolute truth that there is no absolute truth is a self-defeating aspect. Do you understand that? Do you understand how when people make statements like that, you can say, logically, that's not consistent. Well, one of the variants, and again, I'm walking you through the book here. This is not, this is, you can read, they have a lot more detail about this stuff. A second option, when this was pointed out to people who believe in relativistic truth, they would say, well, then, they would say what Jane Fonda said at that time, well, there are no absolute truths to me, but that may not be true to you. I mean, you may not believe that as an absolute truth, so therefore it's valid. Well, it's not valid because that statement is meaningless. To say there is no absolute truth to me, but that might be true for you, simply doesn't say anything. There's no propositional content. It's like saying the sky may or may not be blue. All right? There's no absolute truth for me, but that may not be true for you. Doesn't go anywhere. Do you see what I mean by that? Why did you say anything? If that's what you're going to say, it doesn't mean anything. It's meaningless. The sky may or may not be blue. I may or may not be alive. Well, are you or aren't you? That is not, there is no propositional content. Propositional content means, does it make any kind of statement that can be deemed to be factual, either true or false? There's no propositional content in that. It doesn't go anywhere. So that's a defeater. <coughs> so, some say, well, all truths are socially conditioned. Meaning, it's based on the context of your culture. That's the same thing. That's, that's saying exactly the same thing. Is there are no absolute truths for me, but that may not be true for you. There's no propositional content. The sky may or may not be blue. It doesn't go anywhere. Why even say it? You following me? Question about that? Do you begin to understand how a logical process will help you understand how to respond to some of these kind of statements. Well, if you if you respond to 
somebody says there's no absolute truth and you say that really isn't true, they're going to start. Well, that's not the right thing to say. What your, your answer is, on what do you base that? Okay. And by, by asking them questions and asking them to explain it, I think you can lead them in a gentle way. Second Peter says, always be ready to give an explanation with the hope that is in you, but to do so with kindness and gentleness. Our, our goal isn't to smack somebody upside the head with the truth, knocking them on, you know, epistemologically unconscious. <laughs> our issue is to help them, first ourselves, to understand how to think about these things, and then gently to help other people think about these things. So to say, well, on what do you base that statement? And if you ask questions like that, and you begin to walk them through this sort of reasoning, well, don't you think it's true that saying there is no absolute truth is in itself a statement that purports to be absolute truth? That's how I would approach it. Okay? I wish I could think that fast. That's why you're doing this, is so you learn this stuff. Yes? Well, the other thing of that is, is people who claim those things in reality do not want to live by those conditions that there are absolute truths. They do not want to live by it at all because the proposition, if that is true, can lead you to many, many evils of this world right. that they don't, that they will say are wrong, but they have no basis of saying they're wrong if this statement well, is true. I think it is true that uh, a lot of people do not understand the consequences. Much of the evil that exists in the world today exists because people have lost a sense that there are absolute truths, which means there are absolute values, things that absolutely are right and wrong. And I think most people are unaware of the consequences of this kind of thinking. But it's also true, and you need to be aware of this, some people would say things like, I don't believe anything is absolutely true, because they're saying, I don't believe there's any absolute reason why I shouldn't sleep with as many women as I can. Okay, or make as much money as I can at the expense of poor people, or whatever else it is. They don't want to accept the consequences of saying there are absolute truths, there are absolute values, which is further down the road. We're, going to get, we're getting into ethics there. But the values, you know, axiology or the values theory that includes ethics, what's right and wrong, are consequence to, meaning they follow on how we believe these things, what we believe about these things. Okay? Fair? Okay. So, having said that, we can say quite unequivocally, the relativistic claim that there is no absolute truth is either self-defeating or it's meaningless. So therefore, it must be false. It must be false that there is no truth. Therefore, there must be such a thing as an objective or absolute truth. This is a logical argument. This is constructed based upon a logical reasoning. Is there any part of that that you think is inaccurate? Because if you, if you go through that, and you say, yes, I believe all of that makes sense, I believe all of that is true, then you have just discovered an absolute argument for the existence of objective truth in the world. And therefore, you should never fall victim to this idea that, well, it may be true for you, but it's not true for me, or, well, it's only true for you because you learned that from somebody, or any of those other kinds of arguments. You now have a foundational system of logic that allows you to understand and to present argument for the existence of objective, absolute truth. Don't you think that's a pretty big deal? Do you see the value in that? Yeah. Is everybody just stunned? I mean, I'm getting a few nods, but yes. I mean, I sit down with a young lady over breakfast who claimed to not know that there was a God and went through this very thing, and by the time we were done with breakfast, she said, there must be a God. Mm -hmm. This very thing. Yep. So, now, 50 minutes into this, do you understand why, even though it's hard, it's really worthwhile to go through this and to learn this stuff? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, before I get into the next section, which are the philosophical theories about the meaning of truth, Remember, the meaning of these things is, is one of the issues that gets that people get hung up on. Let's go ahead and take our break right now. So, what is? Let's go from the question "What is truth?" to "What is meant by truth?" We're getting a little bit more specifically into 
um, the meaning of that. There are three major philosophical theories about the meaning of truth. This is all in the reading you had for this week. I'm just summarizing and helping explain it to you. So you can go back and read this stuff too. So three major, I mean, there are, people have all sorts of different ideas, but there are three that have been considered legitimate alternatives for understanding, theories for understanding the meaning of truth. The first of these, which is also the oldest, the one that has been around longest, is the correspondence theory of truth. The correspondence theory of truth, in other words, what is meant by truth, says that a proposition is true if and only if it corresponds to the way things actually are. Well, duh, some of you are saying. <laughs> and yet it's not quite so simple as that. Now, you need to note something here. This is about whether or not a proposition is true, not about whether or not we can know it's true. A thing can be true whether we know it's true or not. That's one of the principles behind the, um, the uh, just to blank here, to the correspondence, you know, we were talking about the correspondence, coherence, etc. earlier. Let's see. The, the idea of uh, yeah. the Pythagoras theorem. Proves What's that? Pythagoras theorem proves it. Um, Would it not? Okay, I'm not going to get into that. You know, uh, the, the square of the, you know. Yeah. It's mathematical. Well, it's true whether you know it or not. Right. Well, and they use the example in the book, which I think is a good one. Is if, if someone says um, there is a purple grain of sand on the far side of the moon. Now, that could be true, but it's unlikely we're ever going to know if it's true. But it could still be true. So the issue here is when we talk about the correspondence theory of truth is it's true if it corresponds with a um, with the way things actually are, okay. So in that case, I'm, I don't know for sure if that's the case. But if somebody made that statement, it could be true whether I know it or not. So this isn't about knowing it; it's about is it. Got that? And that that comes up later when we start when we get into some of the other philosophical issues. That's why I mentioned it here. The second, and I'm going to come back and talk about each of these, but I want to present all three of them first. The second theory of truth is the coherence theory of truth. That is that a proposition is true if and only if it coheres with a set of beliefs that a person already holds. Is it consistent? Is there a consistency between this thing and what I already believe? And if so, it can be perceived as true. That's a different idea about what constitutes truth. And I'll come back and talk about it. The third theory is the pragmatic theory of truth which says that a proposition is true if and only if it is useful to the believer in achieving desirable results. In other words, this theory, the pragmatic theory of truth, says truth is what works. Um, C.S. Pierce, Charles Sanders Pierce, who is mentioned in the book, he and William James are the two primary, the primary pragmatists, um, Pierce said truth is what you're willing to fight for. <laughs> That's about as pragmatic as you can get. There are some aspects of pragmatic truth that we would have to we would have to agree with, <laughs> not all of it, but the extent to which ultimately we believe what is true works and what is false will not work eventually, long term, right? And so there's some aspects of each of these that we could say there's some some as, some reliability to. The primary hold that that we as Christians as Christian philosophers, which you all are, that we would maintain is the correspondence theory of truth. And the reason very simply is because coherence and pragmatic theories are ultimately relativistic. That means within the coherent and the pragmatic ideas of truth, there can be contradictory statements that can be subjectively and contextually accepted as true. They use the example, for instance, Babe Ruth thought he was the best ball player in the whole world. That was consistent with his beliefs, and that may have helped him be the best ball player in the world. Lou Gehrig probably thought otherwise, and people would have difference of opinions. Now, for instance, on the coherent set of truth, if, if one of you believes, you absolutely believe that you are the most important person in the nation of Mexico, and somebody else thinks they are the most important person in the nation of Mexico, 
And each of you, for each of you, that's consistent with what you previously have thought about yourself and about the nation of Mexico and all the other things related to that. Then for you, each of you, that is true. If it's coherent or consistent with what you previously had believed about yourself, about Mexico, about circumstances. And yet, do we really think that both of those two beliefs can be true? It's coherent. When Carolyn says you're the best, <laughs> and I say, no, no, you're the best. <laughs> That's coherent, isn't it? Is it? All right, so, but you can see one of the problems with the coherence theory is that it allows contradictory beliefs to be, to be accepted as true because it, they are subjective. Because coherence inherently is subjective. It's consistent with my beliefs, so therefore I can accept it as being true, even though it may not be true in any larger scene. Likewise, prag the pragmatic theory of truth may say, um, this works for me. Well, what if it doesn't work for you? You know, Since I'm stronger than you, it works for me to believe that I should take everything you own. Mm -hmm. Well, that may not be pragma pragmatically true for you. And yet, in principle, the pragmatic theory of truth would allow both of those beliefs to be considered true from different perspectives. That's why I say they're subjective and relativistic. Okay? As we have seen, relativism, that is, there's no absolute. It's entirely dependent upon a subjective perspective or circumstances or the contextualization of a you know, culture. That approach to truth, relativism, is either self-defeating or it is meaningless. So there are inherent problems with either the coherence or the pragmatic view of truth. And that is why Christianity holds to the correspondence theory of truth. That truth, <clears throat> a proposition is true if and only if it corresponds to the way things actually are. Right? But people do hold those things. People will say, you know, um, well, I believe that white people are superior. Therefore, Slavery is justified. We justify all kinds, and that's, that is a coherence theory of truth. And when slavery existed in the United States, there were all sorts of justifications that they offered to say, well, here are all the things that we believe, and given all those things we believe, to believe that it is legitimate and in fact appropriate for us to enslave people who are not white, is completely consistent. It is logically consistent. It is coherent with our other beliefs. And therefore, believing in slavery must be true. Do <clears throat> you get that? The pragmatic theory of truth would say, well, you know, I'm a plantation owner in the 1830s in the United States, and it works for me to spend money once to buy, buy a slave and therefore have them work for me so that I get ongoing profit from that. That works for me. So that's, that slavery is true for me the concept behind slavery. You can see how correspondence, or I'm sorry, how coherence and pragmatic approaches to the theory of truth can create all kinds of problems because they're only based upon what I think or what I want or what works for me. Correspondence, while it has, you know, you can make arguments against it, correspondence is the one that is objective. It, um, both coherence, especially coherence, but coherence and pragmatism get sort of cut off from the real world. Correspondence says that a proposition is true if it corresponds with the way things actually are, meaning that there is a greater reality that we have to take into account. The idea of coherence and pragmatism as theories of truth is only what I think. It's all internal. It's all subjective. And it cuts me off from any sense that there is a real world that my definition of truth has to take into account. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And yet, those are real things. Correspondence theory of truth and pragmatic theory of truth, people really do base their perceptions of what is true on those ideas. You meant coherence, didn't you? Oh, what did I say? Coherence and pragmatism, not correspondence. Yeah. Now, the one argument that is often, well, there are several arguments, but the primary argument that people have made against the correspondence theory of truth, the one that, that we maintain, I'm presuming here, we, that I maintain, that Christianity has maintained, 
is they would say, well, correspondence theory of truth says that a proposition is true if and only if it corresponds to the way things actually are. But what does it mean to correspond to? They question that the meaning of that term. Do you see how this goes back to linguistics and symbols, semiotics? What does it mean for something to correspond to the way the world really is? And so they said, well, you could say that other ways. You could say that it means the truth is something that accurately expresses or describes a fact about the world. Take out the word correspond. It expresses or describes a fact about the world. And then they will say, but what is a fact? Because a fact is an abstract concept. All right? We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, My big so, question is about the way things actually are. Mm -hmm. Because I experience things totally differently from the way you do, or Chris does, or Dean does. And we're getting ready to jump into epistemology, and that is how do we know that what we perceive is accurate, okay? Uh, okay. Justification of beliefs. Okay. Now, um, but one of the problems is the, the arguments against the correspondence theory typically are, but what does it mean to correspond? Well, that it expresses a fact. Well, what is a fact? You get that definition, and they challenge another term, and they challenge another term, and at a certain point, it strikes me that it begins to sound like Pee Wee Herman. You know, I know you are, but what am I? I know you are, but what am I? I know you are, but what am I? I mean, where are we going with that? There's a certain point, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute, where we have to say that there is a reasonable expectation that we know what those words mean. It doesn't have to be completely exact. There is a... For those people who speak the English language with some ability, we know what corresponds to means. We know what a fact is. As one of the writers in, in, in your text says, it seems to me that it's perfectly valid to say that it's a fact that if the train is on time, I will, you know, if the train is not, it does not arrive on time, then I'm going to be late. You don't have to question what a fact is in that situation. It is a statement about what really is. And yet, the arguments about or against the correspondence theory of what is true almost always come back to arguing about definitions of things. And at a certain point, we have to say, you may not have, and I'll talk about this, you may not have absolute certainty, but you have sufficient certainty about what things mean to be able to move forward. You can't be held hostage just because somebody insists on saying, I know you are, but what am I? You know. And you see, you see what that illustration means, what I mean by that? You can always just sort of poke a hole in something. That's radical skepticism. Ultimately, the, the process of arguing those kinds of things, yeah, but what does fact mean? What does correspond to mean? Comes back to naturalism. And I'm, naturalism we're going to get into in future weeks. Naturalism is the predominant philosophy of the world in the West today. And naturalism is the belief that only the physical world actually exists. That there is nothing but the physical world, the matter that exists around us and us, and nothing else. But what that means, and people don't often think about this, is if the physical world is all that exists, naturalism, then there is no morality, there are no values, there are no abstracts, there is no meaning to a word like facts, which, the, you know, fact is a concept, it's an abstract. It's not a thing that you can touch, the word fact. Um, numbers, descriptive properties, etc., etc. All of those things can be challenged because if you're a naturalist, you believe the natural physical world is all that exists, then none of those things are real, ultimately. We're going to talk more about that. But I want to just introduce that because that does come into this conversation. Um, So, you've got an idea. Now, I think you can understand. I gave you some examples. If somebody has a, a coherence theory of truth or a pragmatic theory of truth, their conclusions are going to be very different than yours. The conclusions that are drawn by somebody who holds the correspondence theory versus the coherence or pragmatism, we can look at the conclusions they draw and go, that's completely immoral. Or that is completely selfish. And they would go, no, it's not. It's based upon my, it's consistent with all of my beliefs. Or I find this works for me. Or and so we need to understand the, the, where we come from in terms of how we understand the nature of truth, what the meaning of truth is, will dictate our further conclusions, you know, our, our consequent, our, our resulting conclusions, and how we act. Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, now let's talk about, and in this, we're going to start getting into what you were asking, Lynn, and that is, yeah, but isn't it just what I perceive? What if that's different than what, you know, we 
say that correspondence theory of truth is that it corresponds with the way the world really is. Well, what if our perceptions of that are different? Let's talk a little bit more about what constitutes knowledge. Talk about truth, but how do we know? We get into questions like, can we know something? What does it mean to know something? How can we know that we know? And again, on the surface that may sound silly to you, but these are very serious, real questions that as they get worked out in different, with different answers, affect the way people live. This is real stuff, and it is especially real stuff for us that hold to an absolute objective belief in Jesus as the Son of God. So we ask the question, you know, what is knowledge? And then, are our beliefs justified as knowledge? Here we get into, more formally, the definition of epistemology as a branch of philosophy that is concerned with the nature and scope of knowledge and with justification of our beliefs. Now, our beliefs are the, the things that we hold to be what we know. If I say I know something, that is a belief. I'm going to get into that in a few minutes in terms of justified true beliefs, which you read about in the book. So the question of epistemology is how do I know what is real? How do I know that I know something? Maybe I am stuck in the matrix. All right? You guys read about that, right? You, you guys know the movie The Matrix? I thought about having a special showing of it here. Yeah, I think we should. Because it is, a, it is a brilliant description of exactly the kind of argument we're talking about. If you don't know the movie, fundamentally, the main character comes to find out that there is a massive machine that has everybody in a coma and hooked up to tubes, and as part of that hooking them up to tubes, it's, it, everybody thinks that they're really alive, and they think the world is real, and they're, they're going about their business, when in fact they're floating in liquid someplace hooked up to tubes, and only made to believe that. Okay? Now, that idea did not come from the, the writers of The Matrix. That idea started with René Descartes. He's French, but we forgive him for that. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. I just have to. As a Canadian, I'm not so sure. <laughs> okay. um, investigate Ren that. René Descartes is considered the father of modern philosophy. Remember I talked about the fact that there are different periods. Modern philosophy is considered to have begun with René Descartes, 1596 to 1650. And I look at that and I go, yeah, when René Descartes was my age, he'd been dead for three years. You know, um, René Descartes was, was brilliant. He was a mathematician and a philosopher. He created what came to be known as methodological skepticism, meaning he was very methodical. In trying to decide what could be known, how do we know? And then how do we know we know? Descartes went through a process to, to figure out how, what could he be certain of. And in the process of doing that, he began to, to sort of take off the board anything that he believed he could be misled about. And he actually presents the idea that what, he, he asked the question, what if there were an evil genius? And this evil genius had some means by which he was convincing me things were true when in fact they weren't. Well, what might I, what can I be sure of? If the evil genius is, is lying to me about all this stuff, if my perceptions can't be trusted because this evil genius, or the matrix, is doing this, what can I be sure of? And he said, well, I can't really be sure of my sense experiences because that could be, the evil genius could be lying to me about that. And he went on, on and on and on, and he ended up coming down to what, one of the most famous statements in philosophy, which is, in Latin, cognito ergo sum, which means, I think, therefore, I am. What Descartes was saying is, whatever else the evil genius that he had conceived of, maybe lying to me about, the very fact that I'm asking this question, the very fact that I, even if I'm being completely deceived in my perceptions, I couldn't be deceived, I couldn't be asking this question, unless I really existed. So the very fact that I'm thinking about this, that I'm asking this question, or even that I'm being deceived, means I must really exist. And so he boiled, his methodological <coughs> skepticism boiled it all down to one basic thing that he absolutely knew was true, and that was, I think, therefore I am. That's my existence is the one thing that cannot be denied me, no matter how much I'm being led to wrong perceptions. You got that? 
Now, unfortunately, the ramifications, which your book doesn't talk about this, of I think, therefore I am, that was the first step in us becoming an ultimately subjectivistic culture. That it's all about me. What I think, what I believe. I don't think Descartes meant it that way, but that's what we've ended up with. Now, Descartes was, through his methodological skepticism, was a major, uh, a major cause of, I don't even want to say advocate of, because he, you know, he, unlike Hume, I don't think he was an intentional about wanting people to question things in a negative way. Um, but he really was significantly responsible for the philosophical approach of skepticism, which means the belief or view that we cannot know anything for certain and that our knowledge is at best limited. For Descartes, he questioned everything other than the fact that the very fact he was asking the question meant he existed. So his existence is the only thing he can be sure of. That led to skepticism. Now, it also led to what might be called, and this is, this is a summary of what Descartes was doing, what might be called the skeptical hypothesis. The skeptical hypothesis, hypothesis, like the evil genius idea or the matrix, is that it is possible that I may be wrong about everything I think I perceive. It is possible that if I'm being, if I'm being deceived, there's no way I would be aware of the fact that I'm being deceived. So how can I know that I know? That idea the skeptical hypothesis has always been presented as, well, if you can't prove it, and logically, philosophically, you can't prove anything other than you exist by asking the question, Descartes told us that, then maybe nothing is real. Maybe nothing is true. Maybe all of your perceptions are false. Now, down the road, the ramifications of that become really a big deal. Okay. And we're going to get there. But I'm just I'm introducing you here. It's also true, Descartes was a rationalist. What it means by that is, a rationalist believes that all knowledge ultimately comes through reason alone. When Descartes said, I think, therefore I am, he was saying, my rational perception of myself being a thinking being is the only thing I can be sure of, and that is inherent to me. That happens in my head. It has nothing to do with what I perceive on the outside. It is all my, my mind, my rationalism. So that's why it's called rationalism. Now, there's two ways of thinking about how we gain knowledge. One of them is called a priori knowledge. A priori means before the fact. Plato was a big advocate of this. If, you're, if you know anything about Plato and his idea that there are forms, like we have a concept of the form of a chair, even though a chair may come in a billion different forms, we always recognize it as a chair because we have this built-in, inherent a priori, is the word, understanding of what a chair is, and that that comes in us whether we've learned anything or not, whether we've had any experience of the physical world or not. The other way of thinking is called a posteriori, which means after the fact. It means that any knowledge that we have, any understanding that we have, is based upon our experience of the world. That it is by my experience of the physical world and people and emotions and everything else, by those experiences I develop my understanding of what is real. That I, tabula rasa, you know that expression, which means a blank tablet. The a posteriori believers uh, would say that I only know things, I only learn things by my experience. The a priori believers would say there are some things that are built in. And in fact, later on, Immanuel Kant, probably the greatest technical philosopher who ever lived, even though he's German, um, <laughs> okay. I, say that, I always say that for Bob Blinky's benefit, he's not here today. Um, <laughs> Kant, in his writing of Critique of Pure Reason and Critique of Critical Reason, is talking about how the brain, how the mind, I should say, not the brain, it's not a physical thing, takes in information and processes it. And much of that has to do with what is a priori, what do we have built in before anything else? What is a posteriori, what, what knowledge or truth do we understand based upon experience? Okay. Rationalism believes only in the a priori, that, that it is what my mind does and it's based upon how my mind works and what was there before. And it's because, you know, Descartes was a rationalist because he boiled everything down except his, his mental conception that he existed because he was able to think. All right? Now, so rationalism is one approach to understanding how we know things. The other approach is called empiricism, which actually I should have put it here. This is the a posteriori view, the idea that my beliefs, my knowledge, 
all come from my experience, what I experience in the world. Empirical evidence, you've heard. So rationalism, it's all inside my head. That's where truth is and knowledge. Empiricism, it's all based upon what my experience is of the world. One of the most important empiricists was John Locke, who lived in the late 1600s, early 1700s. Locke talked about, um, he was an empiricist, he believed everything we know we learn from our sense experience of the world. By seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, you know, um, that that's how we gain knowledge. He presented two different kinds of imperial experience, empirical experience. First, sensation is the immediate sensory encounter with objects through sight, hearing, touch, smell, taste. I am having a sensation when I touch this podium, or when I listen to you all yawn, or whatever else it is, what I see, what I touch, what I hear. Sensation is the immediate experience that my senses give me. That's one kind of empirical gaining of understanding and knowledge we talk about. The second, obviously, we talk about love, we talk about honor, we talk about loyalty, commitment, all these things that are not an immediate sense experience. Locke explained those in terms of a second kind of empirical experience, which he called reflection. Reflection is when we take all of those different, the memories of all those different sense experiences, and we combine them in various ways to come up with a whole new set of experiences, which are not physical. It happens inside us, but it's all based upon physical experience. So it's either direct empirical experience, or it is indirect by how I mix and match the things I previously have experienced physically. Got that? Make sense? You can see how that's different than thinking that it's all stuff that happens in my head. This is based upon what happens in my, as I touch the world in one way or another. Now, Locke also, and here's where we get into the perception stuff. Locke also proposed, not only Locke, Descartes did not disagree with this, and there are others who presented this too, what's called a representational theory of perception. It's the suggestion that we never really directly experience anything in the external world. Instead, we only experience the images or the ideas that our minds produce to tell us about those objects. Remember I said earlier that we think in symbols? Well, they would say that even if you look out the window and you see a tree, you are not having a direct experience of that tree. You're having only a direct experience of what your mind tells you that is. That there is a translating process going on between the real world and what your mind perceives. So this is where the perception question comes in. It is the difference between appearance, what I am getting inside, and reality. And that there's always a translation process going on. And some of us have better translators than others. Mental illness is an extreme example of somebody whose ability to perceive and trans, you know, to, to perceive reality in a way that makes sense is broken. Somebody who's colorblind may see a tree and go, that's an amazing red tree. You go, what are you talking about? That's a green tree. Because the translation from the actual physical reality to what we understand in our minds the perception of it, there's, there's a process that goes on. Make sense? That we never directly experience the physical world, we only experience our mind's perception of it as it comes through our senses. Okay? Now, as I said earlier, we think, that is conceptually think, we process in terms of symbols, usually word symbols, that are representations rather than pure perceptions. And let me let me ask you something. Um, what's that? <laughs> okay. Is it anything else? Yeah. It's an elf. What? Elf. Okay. An alif. It's a letter. Let me let me do something. It's the boss of What is it now? Dog. A dog. <laughs> dog with horns. No, it's no, that's his ears. Go, horn, now. The original, you know, so you said it was an upside down A. Take the dots out. Okay, I did that for effect. The Phoenician letter Aleph was the symbol for an ox. And 
they usually did it sideways for some reason. It became our letter A. Our, our alphabet is based upon the symbols from the Phoenician alphabet to a great extent. We have other things, mixtures of other things. But the idea is, the fact that you looked at that and said that's a dog or that's a, you know, an ox or that's a whatever, how in the world did you get that? There is, how does that look like a dog? It's pictures, it's caricatures of puppies. Okay, but is it not true that what just happened there is in your mind you had an understanding of something that you were able to consider that a symbol of? Okay. What is that? It's a stick figure. Okay, it's a stick figure, literally. But what does it represent to you? A man. A man. Now what does it represent to you? A woman. A woman. How do you get that? Get a dress on. But do you see the, the process of, of your, your eyes taking this in and your brain translating that into a concept is exactly what we're talking about when we talk about the theory of perception. You always translate. Okay, you've got that. Now if I do this, what does it mean to you? Okay. Usually exit or bathroom, ladies room or... Think about the complexity of you taking this in by seeing it and processing meaning in that way. We do the same thing with words. I mean, I, I could, you know, we could do that all, uh, all day long. Right? Um, you know, what's that? Bird. A bird. How in heaven's name do you get a bird out of that? Because that's the way artists draw them. But is it not because you have developed a translating process? Okay. You know, we could we could do this, and and you would probably say. Reindeer. Now, if you lived in the Lapland, what would you call this? Reindeer. 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 Because you're from that other part of the that, that's right. So, part of what you get here, when we talk about perception, you see again the relationship between symbols, semiotics. Words are symbols. Okay, the fact that, you know, that true in English, it's not the same word in Spanish or in Latin, veritas, or anything else. We develop these sets of symbols, and they dictate to a great extent how we interpret our perceptions or translate our perceptions into meaning. If you don't know the symbols, you're going to struggle. You're not going to be able to understand the meaning. Lynn? It's really interesting, and you're just bringing up memories of when my kids were very little and we played Pictionary. Mm -hmm. My husband was a very matter-of-fact you know, delving person, he had to have answers right. to all the questions. And we'd sit down, and the kids and I, we'd, you know, a few squiggles, and they'd have it. And he would be so cleaned out totally, because right. those had no meaning to him whatsoever. Right. Yeah. It just points this out. I am, I'm terrible at Scrabble. And the reason I'm terrible at Scrabble is because I'm always trying to make antipodes, or, you know, complementarian. <laughs> or something else instead of A and D, but they're, you know, and, I, and I'm terrible at it. But again, the idea is that perception is a process of translating what we sense in the real world to what our mind holds, and the difference in appearance and reality. We have to understand that that is a symbol process, and that has to do with our understanding of what is real, with our understanding of how we acquire and process knowledge. We also get into, and I'm just going to mention on this, I mentioned here certainty of knowledge and sufficient knowledge. You know, when I, when I use one of these and we say that's a bird, well, somebody else would say, well, that's a, that's a swoosh. You know. The, the idea is, well, how can you be certain, how can you be certain that that's a bird? Or how can it be certain that you see a tree out your window that that really is a tree, and that that tree is a pine tree, and that that tree is whatever? Aren't you pro you're processing this through your filters, and you're perceiving it, and your mind is coming up with both an image and an understanding of what that image means, but how can you be certain? Now, this is the skeptical hypothesis. They would say, you can't know that that's a bird. You just made that up. 
And so we come to the point, our response to the skeptical hypothesis, to the skeptics, in fact, is we have to recognize the difference between certainty of knowledge and sufficient knowledge. We can't be certain of anything, my brothers and sisters. It is by faith that we accept pretty much everything. You know, somebody who says that they're, you know, they don't believe in Jesus because they, they don't have faith in anything, I'm going to go, oh, pfft. You have faith in everything. Everything you perceive, you make a decision about it, and you have faith in that decision. We say, everybody, everybody yell bird when I held this up, okay? And yet, you could say, oh, we don't have any certainty that that symbol is a bird. It may be a symbol for something else, and yet it is sufficient for us to have agreement about that. It is sufficient for us to go on with our lives, or else we would be paralyzed by every challenged perception that we have. So when the skeptics say, yeah, but you can't know for certain, our response is, I don't have to know for certain. I have sufficient knowledge for me to believe it's true. And that is the only response, uh, response to skepticism. Now, let me talk a little bit more about empiricism by introducing you to another figure talked about in the book. This is one of the guys that was most important to me philosophically before I became a Christian. <coughs> Hume, Kant, and Hegel were my trinity at one point. David Hume was my favorite. Hume lived in the 1700s. He was a Scottish empiricist, which means he believed that truth, knowledge, came from our perception of the physical world, not that it was all inherent or a priori in our heads. Okay? He was a, and I should say up front, that by all accounts, David Hume was a sweet man. Everybody loved him. And I say that because as I describe to you what he believed and what he presented, you're going to think he sounds mean. He's not. Because he was able to separate what he philosophically, intellectually proposed and how he actually lived his life. Now, whether or not that's a valid thing or not, he did. Okay. Uh, everybody said he was a very pleasant man. He agreed with Locke in terms of his empiricism, but he went further than Locke. He went further to say that because of this translating process that goes on, that when we have perceptions, we're not experiencing the real thing, we're only experiencing our perception of the thing that comes into us, right? We're translating this mirror. Filtering. Filtering, exactly. Yeah. That because of that, then we can have, Hume said, we can have no real significant knowledge of the external world. The only thing that we can have are the perceptions which our mind create and therefore are unreliable. I used two examples before if somebody is colorblind, or is blind, or is deaf, or is mentally ill. Then what they, their experience of the, of the physical world gets filtered or translated into perceptions that are not accurate to what we believe is the physical world. Well, Hume would say that's true for all of us. We all have broken filters. Or at least we all have filters that are filters so that we never have a direct interaction with the physical world. And so therefore we, we can't really know that it's reliable. We can't know anything for sure. Okay. Nothing he said is really knowable. We only have either direct impressions about the things in the world, meaning our, our perceptions in our head, or we have logical relations between ideas that are produced by those impressions. This is back to sensation uh, or... Uh, just forgot the word, or reflection, as Locke talked about. We either have immediate but un untrustworthy perceptions of the world, or we have what our, what our mind does with it. Now, that's part of it that Hume introduced a fairly radical skepticism, saying that none of these things are certain. Everything is uncertain. That we are at least one step removed from any experience of the real world, and so nothing is really knowable. This is a radical skepticism. Further to that, Hume questioned necessary causality. The idea that we can reliably predict events based on past experience. Example. Any of you guys play pool? Yeah. Okay. What's the objective in pool? You get the ball to the pool. Well, <laughs> the process. You guys. Break over here. No. Um, the objective in pool is that you take the cue stick and you strike the cue ball at just the right place and with the right force, 
that it moves forward and it strikes the object ball, as it's called. If, it's, if you're in the end of a game of eight ball, it's the eight ball. At the right place and with the right spin and with the right force to cause it to move where you want it to be, which is in the hole. Right? Yeah. That is a beautiful illustration and one that, that's, that Hume used and that is used in our book for the idea of necessary or predictable causality. That if you strike that cue ball in just the right way, and it, it is predictable, you can know it's going to travel in a certain way. If it hits the eight ball with a certain force on a certain point, with a certain spin, it is going to cause, and if you do it every time, the, the eight ball is going to go in the hole every time, right? If you always do it right, the same way, it's always going to be predictable. Hume said that's not true. Hume said, logically, the only thing you can say for sure with certainty, certainty is a key word here, is that every other time you watch this happen, that was the case. You don't know for a fact with certainty that when you do it this time, even if you strike the cue ball in the same way, it travels to the same point with the same spin and the same force and strikes the eight ball in the same place. The cue ball can go straight up for all you know. Just because you saw it happen that way before doesn't mean it's guaranteed it's going to happen this time. There is no certainty in causal relationship. From a purely philosophical point of view, David Hume is right, and nobody has ever refuted him. There is no necessary consequent causality. All we can say is we knew it happened that way every other time, and we're hoping it happens that way this time. Now this issue of causality is a huge deal. If, our, if my tribe survived by planting corn, and that was our primary food product, and we planted corn and marigolds came up, if we, if we could not with assurance believe the law of causality says if I plant corn, corn will grow, then I'm in trouble. If I thought that, and I've used this example before teaching this, Carolyn has heard it, if I thought that every time I flipped the light switch in my living room, the house was going to blow up in San Juan Kosala, or might blow up, if I didn't know that the only consequence of my flipping that switch is that the lights are going to come on, if I thought that causality was such that something else horrible might happen, would I ever light my living room again? <laughs> Now those are extreme examples, but you get the idea that when you take apart this idea of causality, when you say we have no real assurance that given the same circumstances we will have the same results in the future, there is radical uncertainty in the world. And from a logical point of view, Hume was right. Nobody has ever really refuted it. Now even Hume said, yeah, but you can't live like that. <laughs> okay? Now. But you need to understand that this is where you, this is how we struggle with the issue of certainty. How do we know that we know? All of this means, according to Hume, the conclusion of some, one of the conclusions of that is that we can have no metaphysical knowledge. Metaphysical means, you know, larger than the physical. No certain knowledge of reality. I can't know what's real. I could be, because I'm one step removed from what's real. And I could be being tricked by this. Everything becomes completely subjective. It means that God is unknowable because I can't have a, you know, according to Hume, I can't have a first-person immediate interaction with God to the extent that I can believe that there is certain knowledge in that. There can be no absolute moral truths. How do you have an interaction, a first-person sensitive kind of worldly interaction with a moral truth? Cause and effect can be predicted. We cannot be certain of the existence of anything. We can only know of the impressions we have, and we don't know that those impressions are accurate. Shall I close in prayer? We all kill ourselves? <laughs> <laughs> and it all ended in a dream. Now, the thing you need to realize is nobody has ever refuted Hume's logic. Because Hume's conclusions are the, the logical outflow, the logical conclusion to a purely empirical perspective, and it is at the core of modern naturalism and skepticism. People reject morality, they reject belief in God, a lot of the other conclusions they draw is because even if they're not conscious of it, they are a product of this kind of 
radical skepticism. How do you know? How do you know you know? How can you be certain? And our answer is, I don't have to be absolutely certain. I have sufficient certainty to move forward. And even Hume would say, you know, you got to get up in the mornings. And apparently, as I say, he's a very pleasant guy. So we have to ask, how much certainty do you need to claim that you have legitimate knowledge of something? Was Locke right that sufficient, and, and Locke, John Locke, unlike Hume, said, it is possible to have sufficient certainty enough to move forward. You don't have to have absolute certainty. Hume was right when he said you can't have absolute certainty. We don't argue with that. We argue you don't have to have absolute certainty. And that's part of me understanding and accepting that I am a broken, fallen, limited creature. I'm not at the top of the pyramid of the, of the world. God is. I'm somewhere pretty far down as things go. And so I can accept the fact I don't know everything. I don't have perfect certainty. And I don't have to. That is our response to that. We, we don't have to claim to the skeptics that we have absolute certainty. But we have sufficient certainty to say, I believe that I know this. And the book does a good job of presenting four levels of certainty. And these are practical levels that are used in the world. The highest level, which, he, which is called level three, is that we are certain beyond all doubt. That's what Hume was saying you couldn't have. Okay, I don't, I don't know anything beyond all doubt. The second level is beyond a reasonable doubt. As the book points out, this is actually considered the moral, the level of moral certainty. This is, beyond a reasonable doubt, is what our legal system requires for somebody to be found guilty of a major crime. We consider that sufficient to execute people <coughs> for whom we have a, we believe beyond a reasonable doubt they have committed a murder, and we can believe that. We can accept that as sufficient, beyond a reasonable doubt. It doesn't have to be absolute. There is sufficient certainty beyond a reasonable doubt. Below that is more probable than not, and equally probable or improbable. We believe that truth as we understand it, including the truth of the Christian faith, you know, there's so much. I'm limited. I'm faulty. There is much I will not know before, until I stand before the Lord, but I am certain enough beyond any reasonable doubt of what I believe and what I have been taught and what I have experienced that I can say I believe. Okay? But we can't be foolish enough to get sucked into the argument with a radical skeptic, a human, who says, but you can't really know for certain. I can argue that all day long, and I will lose if I try to argue with that. My response is, you're right. I can't know for absolute certainty. I don't have absolute certainty, but I have certainty beyond a reasonable doubt. I have sufficient certainty. And more can you. Believe. What's that? And more can you. Well, you could say, and in fact, like, there's also, the, the, you know, there's, there is the, there is the self-defeating part of that as well. When somebody says, you know, you can't absolutely know anything, you go, well, if that's true, then how do you absolutely know that's true? There's a self-defeat in that as well, okay? So I want to I do a couple more real quick things about what is knowledge. We're talking here about propositional knowledge, and the book makes a distinction between knowing how to play golf or knowing a person versus knowing something is true. And again, we get back to definitions. We get confused because many of our words mean different things. I mean, they, they can mean different things in the dictionary, plus certainly they can mean different things to different people, and we have to nail that down. One of the first jobs of philosophy is to define terms. Something funny? Well, I was, in, in Spanish, there are two words, saber and conocer. Right. Would be, exactly. There are different the, words. I mean, the, one would be... Conocer is for people. Yeah. Well, recognizing something. Yeah, mm -hmm. to recognize. To be acquainted with it, as right. opposed to... Well, you know, and they the, say that... Knowing how to play golf. That there are Eskimo tribes who have, you know... 17 words for snow, or 27 words for snow, or whatever it is, because that's more important than it. And so, yes, it is a matter of defining things, of understanding definitions. But propositional knowledge, which is what philosophy is really concerned with, it's not about you know learning how to play a game, saying you know it, or a person. It's our ability to know whether the contents of a statement are true or false. I say is true or false, but the contents are whatever. Um, there is considerable debate, even amongst Christian philosophers, on this question of how do we know propositional knowledge to be true. Okay. Um, traditionally, 
and I'm reviewing all this. This is all in your book. If you don't recognize this, then you haven't read the book. Wait, Justified true belief. It's often referred to as the JTB account or the tripartite analysis, traditional tripartite analysis. It means justified true belief is the traditional proposal that we have knowledge if and only if the proposition in question is true, if we believe it's true, and we are justified in that belief. In other words, we have some evidence for it. Now that has historically been the definition of propositional knowledge. If I believe something is true, and it is true, and I have justification for believing it's true, evidence, then it can be accepted as true propositional knowledge. Fair? Understanding those terms. True means that it's, it's, it's consistent, using the coherence definition, uh, or correspondence definition, rather, it is consistent with the way things actually are. I believe it, and I have a reason to believe it, it's justified. Now, um, unfortunately, that has come under much attack in just in the last 50 years, 60 years. In 1963, an epistemologist, which is a philosopher who studies epistemology, how we have knowledge of things, named Edmund Gettier, demonstrated that justified true belief, while it may be necessary for claiming we have knowledge, for propositional knowledge, it is not by itself sufficient because he was able to come up with several scenarios where a person, something by anybody's sense of knowledge of it, something appeared to be true, they held a belief that it was true, and they had reason to believe it was justified, but he came up with scenarios in which it wasn't actually something that was justified or true, even though there was, seemed to be all sorts of positive argument for it. Particularly, the argument has gone uh, against the question of what does it mean that a belief is justified? What is necessary for us to say that it is a justified true belief? What constitutes justification of the belief that we have that something is true? Um, historically, you've all heard, well, seeing is believing. Anybody who thinks that defines truth? is not paying attention. How could anybody believe seeing is believing? Somebody said with the Ferguson case, they have six different witnesses and they all have a different idea of what happened. You know, just our, our senses are, you know, well, yeah, I was there and I saw it, but it was really foggy, so I'm not sure whether the guy had red hair or black hair. It was dark. Um, the train went by just then and I'm not sure if I heard a gunshot or not. What constitutes accurate justification? All right. Several other things have been added to this idea of justified true belief being what constitutes propositional knowledge. One of them is called reliableism. Just stick an ism at the end of a word, you've got something philosophical. <laughs> reliableism. This is the idea that in addition to JTB, the justified true belief definition or standard of knowledge, the idea that true belief must be produced by a reliable belief forming process. In other words, the justification, you have to demonstrate that it is in some way reliable. For example, if my belief is based on sense experience, my senses must have been used in an appropriate environment and circumstance so that they can be trusted. I just gave examples. Well, it was night and it was cloudy. I'm not sure what I saw. As opposed to, it was 10 o'clock in the morning, I was only 10 feet away, it was a bright sunny day, and the guy was looking right at me. In that case, I think we would say that my vision is much more a justified, a reliable justification for what I perceive as true than otherwise. Okay. So reliableism takes the justified true belief idea and says yes, but the justification has to be whatever it is. It has to be something that is reliable, that the environment and circumstance in which whatever that evidence is, was presented, was something we believe we can trust. And if it's not, now if you're sitting on a jury and you're being asked to adjudicate a murder trial, do you not think that this issue of uh, is the evidence presented to me sufficiently justified that I can believe the claim that this person is a murderer is justifiably true? 
Doesn't it make a difference as to the testimony and whether or not that evidence was reliable based upon the circumstances in which it was given? Do you see the practical application of these questions? And then there's a couple of other issues related to um, our understanding of propositional knowledge, which are big issues in the philosophical circles. And you may not remember this, and you may never care about it again, but you're going to care about it for the next three minutes. <laughs> One of them is some people claim what's called internalism, and that is that a person's justification for their belief, remember, justified true belief, justification is the one that gets questioned. What constitutes justification? Legitimate evidence, in other words. Internalists, uh, people who believe in internalism, believe that the idea that, uh, believe that a person's justification belief must be internal in their own mind. In other words, they have to be able to coherently tell you why they believe what they believe. In other words, they have it in their head and they can explain it. It has to be internal to them or else it's not a legitimate justification. There are other people called externalists, externalism from a philosophical point of view, who would say, no, it doesn't matter whether the person understands why or how they believe something. If they hold it, and they have a legitimate process by which they acquired that, then it is legitimate and justified. So the issue is, do you have to be conscious of what reason or evidence you have for what you believe? Or is it possible not to really be able to explain why you believe it, but as long as you got there in a legitimate way, it's okay? Those are big issues. Christians argue about that. Do I have to give an explanation for the hope that is in me in order to really have belief in Jesus? Or as long as I hold it in faith, you know, and I believe that it's true, although I can't really explain it, is that enough? What do you think? A or B? Which is it? I think it's B. Journalism. Okay, you think it's A. You need to be able to explain it. I think it's B. Okay, now we see why this is an argument. Uh, and argument's not a negative. This is a philosophical disagreement. Christians disagree on this issue. Now, the second one, externalism, is a, a form of reliabilism. It's a, a way of saying, well, that you may not be able to explain it, but as long as it was a valid way that that belief, that knowledge came, then you're okay. All right? Now, I'm going to do real quick one more slide that's got 10 years' worth of knowledge on it. <laughs> on what is knowledge? I'm only going to mention this here, we may bring it up later on, virtue epistemology. Virtue epistemology, which is fairly, it's one of the sort of up-and-coming things, is the idea that since knowledge is achieved by people, there's always, a, there's always a people aspect to the gaining of knowledge. Since knowledge is achieved by people, persons, the study of knowledge should be person-based, which means it should take into account personal characteristics. Again, this is primarily concerned about justification. If a person who is who is offering, who says, I have knowledge of something, justify true belief, if that person can be identified as having intellectual virtue, meaning they're mature, they're attentive, they're open-minded, they have a good memory, they're uh, intellectually courageous, they're fair, etc., etc., what would we would call intellectual virtues. If they can demonstrate that, then that trumps any other need for justification to be demonstrated. All right? That there is a personal aspect. If a person who is perceiving something as a propositional truth has characteristics which are considered intellectually virtuous, then that is sufficient to believe, to justify their true beliefs. That's all I'm going to say about that right now. You can read more about it in the book. We'll talk about it later. A lot of Christians are believing that now. And the thing I like about it, I don't completely agree, but the thing I like about it is it puts some responsibility on us to work at this. It's not just something happening to us. We have to be concerned about being intellectually virtuous. Attentive, open-minded, having a good memory, intellectually courageous, fair, etc. That there is some aspect of truth knowing that we have responsibility for. Okay? Now, shifting gears, but it's the same slide. Alvin Plantinga actually created this term, noetic structure. And that is, I mentioned earlier that Kant, Kant in his Critique of Pure Reason and Critique of, of Practical Reason, especially Pure Reason, deals with how the human mind takes knowledge in and processes it. This somewhat has to do with that. The noetic structure of a person's mind, which is how they think about things, how they take
take in information, how they process it, whether they accept it as knowledge, how they develop their beliefs, all the stuff we've been talking about. The noetic structure is the entire set of a person's beliefs together with the logical and explanatory reasons for those beliefs. In other words, this is what you've got in your mind that dictates how you process what comes in and what you take as knowledge and belief, or what you reject as being unbelievable. There are um, three basic forms in this. One is foundationalism. It is the oldest. This is the premise that a good noetic structure, which is the structure you have in your mind of beliefs, is based on a foundational beliefs that are immune or at least resistant to doubt. That you have some basic beliefs and all your other beliefs are built on that. Now, there's two kinds of this. There's classical foundationalism, which says that the only beliefs that can be considered basic in your, in your noetic structure are those beliefs that are self-evident, that there's no such thing as a married bachelor. There's a logical self-evidence in that. Or that one plus one equals two, you know, mathematical evidence. It's self-evident, it's incorrigible, which means it can't be changed or challenged. Or it is evident immediately evident to the senses, experienced now. That's a very strict definition in classical foundationalism. Very few things can be considered basic beliefs then. A modest, a more modern version, which is called modest foundationalism, is a, has a much more generous or modest acceptance of what can be considered a basic belief. But still the idea is there are basic beliefs, and then there are related beliefs on top of that. Your basic beliefs dictate what you can accept as other related beliefs. Another... A system is called coherentism. You hear words like correspondent and coherent a lot of times. This has nothing to do with the coherent theory of truth. Coherentism, which is basically a kind of logical consistency, is the premise that there's no such thing as basic or undoubtable beliefs. Rather than there being a foundation of basic beliefs and then you have other things built on that, it's like a web. All of your beliefs are equal and they're tied to one another. They're all interdependent on one another. Um, and that any belief that comes in is justified in terms of its ability to fit into that whole web of beliefs. And finally, contextualism is the premise that beliefs in your noetic structure are justified by the particular context in which they're experienced. Now, there is there are Christians who maintain, there are not many people who maintain foundation, classical foundationalism anymore, because it's just too rigorous. I mean, it's just, it, it demands too much for people to believe in it. But a modest um, foundationalism, that there are basic beliefs and everything's built on that. There are Christians who maintain that, probably more than any other, but there are also Christians that maintain coherentism. The idea that our beliefs are more a web system and as they come in, do they fit into the web? The contextualism is primarily a, uh, a relativistic kind of approach. The idea that beliefs are justified by the context. It's just like contextualism as a view of truth. Okay? Whatever context you come out, whatever cultural context. So the question is, how do we acquire and process and hold and maintain beliefs? Alvin Plantek has written a lot about this, but obviously this affects what goes on in our mind and how we do this process has a lot to do with what we accept as being true, what we accept as a belief, what we accept as being justified true belief, which is propositional knowledge. How do we know? This looks at how does your mind process it. And Kant said a lot about that, but trust me, you're not ready to get into the critique of your reason. Any questions about that? I've gone over a few minutes, I apologize. Did this help you? Yes. Okay, but did it did it help for me to give examples and stuff? Yeah. Yeah, sure. But it's just over theory. It's a lot. Okay. We'll make this a 16 week course next time. Okay. Thank you this time, huh? <laughs> Thank you folks for being here. Hang in there. Remember, I don't expect you to get it all. You're not going to become formal logicians. You're not going to become philosophers overnight, but it will help. <laughs>